A figure in black robes wearing a white porcelain featureless mask floats towards you. The back of its head seems to be missing, and in its place, a dim ball of light that leaks through the mask's eyes and mouth. Gazing at it, if you look for just a moment too long, seems to almost put you in a trance-like state, and the creature begins making a beeline silently for the sorcerer. Roll initiative. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig into the past of D&D and find old creatures that have been long forgotten and bring them to light for use in your 5th edition games. I am your host Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're once again going back to the old treasure trove of the third monster manual from Dungeons & Dragons 3.5. Our creature today is the Visalite, a construct type creature that floats around innocuously and does a whole bunch of creepy stuff. Despite their incredibly unsettling and somewhat ghost-like appearance, as I mentioned, they are not ghosts, they are constructs. And like many constructs, they have a single drive that kind of serves as their one purpose for existing, and that is to become perfect. Or at least perfect from their point of view, which, as far as they're concerned, is to become the most beautiful creature imaginable. See, Visalites view beauty as perfection, so their goal is to scour the multiverse and find as much beauty as they can and absorb it in what is an incredibly unsettling ritual. So, of course, today I'm going to talk to you about just exactly what these these guys can do in battle, some ways that I've changed up the base creature to better suit 5th edition, and of course some plot hooks and ways that you can use this creature in your home D&D campaign. But for now, avert your eyes and roll initiative because it is time for... So Visalites have a move speed of 30 feet which is pretty standard for most creatures, however they can also fly and hover. Being able to fly is extremely good, but being able to fly and stop in place is also very good because it allows you to avoid all manner of obstacles that a creature who can't levitate, for example, might not be able to avoid. Large pit traps, spikes, huge gaps in infrastructure, whatever it is, these creatures can pretty easily navigate their way around any battlefield. They also have a trait that functions very similarly to the gaze of a Medusa. If you make eye contact with one of these creatures, they will hinder you, not so aggressively as a Medusa. You're not going to turn to stone, but they are able to stun creatures that look at them for too long. And of course, if you fail your save terribly by five or more, you're not just stunned, but you're paralyzed for 1d4 rounds. Now this isn't something the Visalite has to actively do or activate, this is just a side effect of what happens if a creature just looks at it. Now there are a lot of ways to get around this, again, much like fighting a Medusa, you'd use similar tactics, you would just look at the ground and try to look at its feet, so you'd kind of know where it is, see maybe 5-10 feet around you, but... You're not going to be able to see too much, so you're going to be taking disadvantage in all of your attacks against it, or you just stare it straight in the face and hope you make those saves. And of course it has a baseline melee attack in the form of a steel claw that it can use twice every turn, so it gets a couple of attacks. And these claw attacks do a decent amount of damage, but what makes them special is that A, if they manage to connect with a creature, that creature is also grappled, which is going to be really important for the next ability, but we'll get there in a minute. And the second part of their claw attacks is that they do double damage against objects, meaning that they're going to have an advantage if they can get rid of those pesky weapons that some adventurers might be holding. Anytime a creature can sunder a player's longsword or mace or whatever they're using is good, especially in a dungeon, because if you're in the middle of a dungeon and your weapon is destroyed, that makes it a very awkward situation trying to get back out or venture further without running into combat. Because trust me, no fighter wants to go into a battle without their greatsword or whatever weapons they happen to be comfortable with. Now its next attack is probably the most thematic one and is kind of what is at the core of this creature. It is called Charisma Drain. It can only use this attack against a target who is grappled, however if it does have someone grappled, it simply does this. The attack automatically hits, there's no save or anything, it just does 1d6 psychic damage. Now that doesn't seem like a big deal, but the second half of this attack is that creature then loses charisma from their charisma score equal to the amount of psychic damage taken. Now this charisma doesn't simply just disappear, it is drained away and the Visalite's charisma score goes up by that amount. And for every 2 charisma that it gains, of course its charisma modifier is going to go up by plus 1, and this is the modifier that it uses for determining the save DC of its Blinding Gaze ability. So literally the more charismatic and more beautiful this thing becomes, the harder it is to look at without becoming stunned. 
Because remember, Visalites view beauty as perfection, so they're going to go after the most charismatic members of the party, so your paladin, your sorcerer, your warlocks even, whatever it is, and try to drain that charisma away. Coincidentally, those are also the classes that don't want to have their charisma drained away for the most part. Now, of course, it is possible you may just happen to have a fighter in the party who's very charismatic, and if that's the case, then great, but they're going to be going after whoever has a higher charisma score than them, specifically. Another creepy detail about this is as they absorb the charisma and essentially the personality from somebody, the mask on their face kind of begins to take the shape of that person, which is just a neat detail. And the charisma that's drained in this way, of course, it's not permanent. It does come back slowly over the course of days. But an interesting thing you'll want to consider before using this creature is what happens to a character when their charisma score is reduced to nothing. In 5th edition, because ability damage is so rare, we don't actually have rules for this that are concrete. And it's even harder when you're looking at something as esoteric as charisma, because what does that mean if a person's charisma score is reduced to zero? I mean, if your constitution score gets dropped to zero, you die. That seems pretty straightforward. Um, if your strength score is dropped to zero, you can no longer move around. You're still alive, but you're essentially inert. But with something like charisma, it's very esoteric. What is charisma really? You could rule it simply as this person is killed, as if any of your ability scores drop to zero, you are no longer a functioning being, and that's fine, that makes sense. You could also rule that this person is, instead of dying, if your charisma drops to nothing, you're reduced to like a blathering fool and you can't really do anything. You're essentially dead, but without being actually deceased, you just have to wait for the charisma score to slowly but surely return. Because I mean, even an ooze has a charisma score of one, so. To me, the idea of losing all of your charisma is essentially losing all of your personality. Like, the person left behind is still alive, but they're essentially a husk with no one there. I'm not sure exactly how I would roleplay that, but in-game I would say they're probably just paralyzed or stunned, and they kind of would just become a burden to the party until they can get that charisma back, either by waiting out the duration, or by using restoration or some other kind of magic. Whatever you decide the consequence should be though, it's something to think about before using this creature, and try to make it interesting and something your party specifically will enjoy and find, at the very least, dramatic. And like I said, if you want to keep it simple, going by the old school rules, if their charisma score is reduced to zero, they simply are just killed. But that is something to think about. Anyways, moving on, we are going to take a look at some... So another theme I really enjoyed with these creatures was the fact that they kind of spend their lives like scouring the universe looking for any sources of beauty that they can absorb essentially. Something I figured would come with that is this idea that they have a lot of knowledge kind of just collected from the multiverse and the many places they've been. So I gave them a trait called Font of Knowledge that basically allows them to roll any knowledge checks with advantage and no matter what they roll it's always treated as at least a 10. And this would be because they can draw on this huge pool of knowledge and experience to try to know different facts about different things. This is ultimately a pretty small addition and affects combat in no way, but I think it adds a nice bit of flavor and gives them something else to do outside of battle. Another thing I changed is I gave these guys the ability to speak, because the original creatures didn't talk, it specifically said that they would not communicate with anyone who wasn't another Visalite, which I find kind of boring. There are some creatures where that totally makes sense, but for the Visalite I thought why not have this creature be able to interact with the party, or anyone else for that matter. I mean, maybe it will choose not to some of the times, but it should have the ability to speak, at the very least telepathically, to other creatures. So that's exactly what it can do. It can speak common, primordial, infernal, and celestial. Again, doesn't have a whole lot of use in combat, but outside of combat just gives this creature some more options for roleplay, and I think makes it a bit more flavorful overall. These changes aren't huge, but I do think they are quite impactful. And speaking of doing things outside of combat, let's take a look at some... So as far as using these guys in a dungeon goes, they would make excellent minions for like a wizard's lair, such as a wizard tower or an ancient dungeon, just anywhere where knowledge might be found. Like you could even throw these guys in as a random encounter in some kind of celestial library on an alternate plane of existence or something. I could totally see a cast of these creatures being used as like curators at some kind of archivist tower, and if you're playing in a high magic setting, it doesn't even have to be somewhere super weird, maybe just in Faerun there's some kind of great library there and the Visalites are the ones who kind of tend to the books. 
Like, if you wanted to, you could just throw out a lot of the lore and just have these guys basically be magic librarians. And thinking back on this, another creature I made where I said a very similar thing was the Chrono Tyrant, which was like over a year ago now. So I kind of want to make a giant library dungeon with the Chrono Tyrant as the boss and Vizalites as like the curators, basically. Another really fascinating thing about these creatures that's just kind of barely even mentioned in the original text, but I chose to expand upon it in my conversion document, is that they are all said to be the same creature, basically just like a schism of that creature split off to go out and explore the world. And that same creature is this one construct somewhere on the plane of Mechanus that is the one seeking to become the most beautiful entity in the multiverse. So with that in mind, that kind of makes all of the Vizalites part of this huge hive mind that operate across planes. So if you wanted to, you could use that being as the big bad even of a whole campaign and have the Vizalites show up as kind of manifestations of that creature who when they're killed, it's not like the boss is really dead, it's just a piece of it, but it's kind of how that boss operates throughout the world. You could even play it up as if there's some kind of secret to attaining perfection hidden somewhere in the multiverse and the players are racing to find it before the Vizalites can get to it first. Or if you wanted to, you could even make the Vizalites helpful NPCs and have that one singular entity, a benevolent entity, that kind of helps the players along on their way. I mean, it could even be the one sending them on some kind of quest. Maybe its goal to achieve perfection isn't a nefarious one, it just wants to achieve that perfection and then use its newfound power to the good of the multiverse. Maybe Vizalites would show up from time to time and trade gold and information with the players in exchange for information they might have about places the Vizalites could investigate to find some kind of lead to achieving this perfection, this impossible goal. That could be a really interesting kind of side quest too, if you didn't want to make this the whole focus of a campaign, just have a Vizalite show up and offer the players some kind of reward for going to a dungeon that it either can't get to or doesn't want to get to itself, and the players need to retrieve some kind of scrap of information or some kind of ancient tome that's been left there. And another thing to consider too is what would happen if the Vizalites ever did achieve perfection? This one being now, all the Vizalites kind of would, I imagine, coalesce into this one being, and it could be benevolent, it could be harmful, that's something to consider and might be a good source of fuel for some kind of adventure as I previously mentioned. An encounter of godlike proportions like that with a very powerful being could be an excellent either enemy or ally for the group. And another thing to keep in mind too is if you do stick with the lore, that motivation of absorbing beauty is a very interesting one. Because maybe there's some kind of creature, whether they're good or evil, that the Vizalites are trying to protect because they view it as so beautiful that it needs to be saved. So that ultimately the Vizalites can of course then absorb its beauty for themselves. Could be a really interesting dynamic and ultimately I think that's part of what makes these creatures so interesting and cool to run is they have a very strange way of interacting with the world. And I think that just about sums up all I really have to say about these creatures. I think they're super cool and if you have a place for them in your game I definitely recommend giving them a try. And maybe some of you have had these creatures used on you in the past, and if that's the case, leave a comment and tell me about it, because I'm always looking for new ideas to implement the creatures that I convert from older versions of the game. And of course, the same thing goes if you are making future plans right now to use this creature in your game. And if you would like to do so, if you look in the description below, you will find the Google document with all the stats and basically everything you'll need to run this creature right there. And of course, if you are one of my lovely patrons in the Google Drive for patrons there, you will be able to find the monster manual style stat block for this creature as well. And as always, while you're down there, you can check out all the other social media stuff, Twitter, Discord, everything else, you know what it all is. And of course, I just want to thank each and every one of you guys for watching these videos and supporting this channel. It means the world to me and I can't thank you enough. So thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Until then.